بركة الفاتحة بسم الله أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والحمد حقه كما يستحقه حمدا كثيرا وأعوذ به من شر نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد الله وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين السلام عليك سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوات قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل ما يعبأ بكم ربي لولا دعاؤكم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, for the acceptance of the deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior, عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف, enlighten your souls, purify your hearts with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد wa Ali Muhammad. Respected scholars, elders, sisters and brothers, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. This constitutes a very important part of the literature found within Islamic teachings, but specifically within the school of Ahl al-Bayt. It is one that affects the lives of millions of human beings who often adhere closely to it on a regular basis. And it's been recently subject to a number of misconceptions, a number of questions that indeed have highlighted or have posed a question regarding its authenticity. The du'as and the ziyara literature of the Shia, are they authentic? is a question of paramount importance to the lives of each and every one of us today. And that you recognize, perhaps on a daily basis, certainly on a weekly basis, definitely on a monthly basis, and without a shadow of a doubt, on an annual basis, many of us come to recite the supplications, the ziyaras from the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'een. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. 
whether it's the du'as after each salah, whether it's du'a tawassul on Tuesday nights, or du'a kumail on Thursday nights, or the du'as that have been recommended for certain times of the year in Sha'ban, or for example, the month of Ramadan, or the ziyaras for the Holy Prophet and the Imams recited during the week, or on the day of Friday for the Holy Twelfth, or the ziyara literature for when we go to ziyaras and honor their lives when it comes to the holy shrines. The du'as and the ziyaras that we have today are inseparable from our lives. From a young age, we've been taught to recite them. Some of us have memorized them. Ziyaras such as, for example, ziyarat warith or ziyarat ashura. Du'as, for example, like Dua al-Faraj or Dua al-Nudba or Dua al-Iftitah. Many of these are recited by most of us. And some, without a shadow of a doubt, even memorized by children, by people of young age. The important element that arises is that we feel it is transformational. It's inspirational. It's motivational. It helps you and I. Somehow we have become acquainted with it because, number one, we feel it connects us to these holy individuals. When I recite the ziyara of Sayyid al-Shuhada, I feel a sense of connection to what he stood for, isn't it? Number two, the other reason why perhaps we have developed a close affinity with these particular ziyaras and du'as from the Ahl al-Bayt is the idea that when it comes to supplications within the religion of Islam, they serve a very important purpose. The objective of du'as within the religion of Islam is highlighted in the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 22, verse number 77 says, قُلْ مَا يَعْبَأُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْ لَا دُعَاءُكُمْ If you do not turn to Allah in dua, He would not turn to you. Meaning, that it's something intrinsic and you and I need it in our lives. Because du'as and ziyaras often are understood to be one thing, hajat. You often hear, recite ziyara, hajat. Dua, hajat. Isn't it? But perhaps we've missed the point. There is no doubt that seeking the fulfillment of wishes after du'as and ziyaras is one of the objectives. But it's not the main objective. Quran says, if you wish to attain proximity to Allah, if you wish to connect with Allah, then you have to supplicate. That supplication serves a purpose, number one, and that is to develop an affinity and a close relationship and a connection with our Creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows we need to speak to Him. Allah has created us, engineered us with the desire to supplicate to Him. Question that arises is, how do we do so? Yes, there are supplications in the Holy Quran. They are majestic. They are brilliant. But many a times, what do we do also? We need those who have understood and mastered the art of speaking to Allah to teach you and I how to communicate to the only beloved. They are our teachers. They are our masters. They will instruct us how to develop this close affinity with Rabbul Alameen, isn't it? That's why when you come to the messenger of God, the most perfect human being, and you listen to his dua when he was in an area known as Ta'if, he says, Allahumma ilayka ashku, dha'fa quwwati wa qilla tahilati, wa hawani ala nasi ya rabbal alameen, ya Allah. I am here all by myself. I have to speak to you. People have turned against me, but I have you, O oh my dear Lord. You look at the commander of the faithful and his supplications when he comes forward and says beautifully in the dua that you and I recite with passion, with enthusiasm, with commitment. فَهَبْنِي يَا إِلَٰهِ وَسَيِّدِي وَمَوْلَاي صَبَرْتُ عَلَىٰ عَذَابِكْ فَكَيْفَ أَصْبِرُ عَلَىٰ فِرَاقِكْ Ya Rabb, I may be patient by what? Going through your punishment, but there is one thing I can never bear and to be far away from you. أَمْ كَيْفَ أَسْكُنُ فِي النَّارِ وَرَجَائِي عَفُّكْ How can I be an inhabitant of hellfire and my desire? is for you to forgive me. You look at Sayyid al-Shuhada, he comes forward and says, Oh Allah, I bear witness, if I come to you with my full conscience, 
with my existence, with my forehead, with the lines in my forehead, with my flesh, with the socket of my eyes, with the socket of my nose, with the palate of my mouth, with my veins, with my skin, with my blood, with my organs, with my eyes, with my ears, with everything that you have given me from the beginning of time till the end of time, I am continuously with all these thanking you. I will never be able to fulfill the thanks because you have given me the ability to say thank you. Then you have Sayyidu Sajideen, Zayn al Abideen, comes forward and says, Oh Allah, if you make me of the people of Jahannam, I will do one thing. I will tell the people of Jahannam how much I love you. And you have the twelve, holy 12th Imam, yes, continuing on this legacy. And comes forward and says, فَلَمْ أَرَ مَوْلًا كَرِيمًا أَصْبَرَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدٍ لَئِيمٍ مِنْكَ عَلَيَّ Ya Rabb, I have never seen a Lord that is so merciful, be so kind and generous against a servant who's miserly. إِنَّكَ تَدْعُونِي فَأَوَلِّ عَنْكَ You call me and I turn away from you. وَتَتَحَبَّبُ إِلَيَّ فَأَتَبَغَّضُ إِلَيْكَ You shower me with love, but I reciprocate it with enmity and disrespect. Therefore, the idea that emerges in this regard is what? Is the treasure of Ali Muhammad when it comes to the du'as and the ziyaras are close to our hearts. And many a times we have indeed cried and shed a tear. Many a times we feel that connection when we recite this literature. However, there is now a trend that has emerged. There is now a group of people who are within the school of Ahl al-Bayt in this modern era who have come out on YouTube and have begun to place question marks and indeed dismiss the dua and the ziyara literature of the Ahl al-Bayt. They've come forward and said the following. And this message is being listened to and watched by some of our youth who are being confused. What is their message? They say these du'as that you recite, this du'a in nudba that you recite on a Friday morning or a du'a on the day of Eid, this, for example, du'a al-faraj that you recite after each ziyara, they say this is not reliable. Why? Because when you look at the chain of narrations, it's broken. In the study of hadith literature and the sciences of hadith, this is referred to as something that is morsel. Morsel means it's not connected from one narrator to another all the way to the imams. It is broken as far as the chain. So the narrator would say, and fulan, and fulan, and then there is a gap all the way to the imam. Yes. So they say, based on this, these are weak. These are narrations which are da'if. How can you recite a supplication which is da'if, which is not authentic? which is not reliable, which is not based on sound authenticity in as far as the science of hadith is concerned. They come forward even further and say, if you look at history of Shia analysis of hadith literature, yet they say that the ulama have placed emphasis upon literature and hadith associated with fiqh, not du'as and ziyarah. They're being meticulous and careful to scrutinize the authenticity of narrations associated with jurisprudence because this affects the lives of each and every one of us. But when it comes to hadith relating to du'as, they have not necessarily paid attention. Therefore, subsequently, the response is, we should not be reciting these du'as and ziyaras because they're weak. Now, some of our youth and elders have panicked. I have received messages from elders in our community, from youngsters in our community for the last few months, and others. And they begin to question themselves. All these years, I've recited Ziyarat Ashura. All these years, Ziyarat al jamia Al-Kabira, Ziyarat al nahiyah al muqaddasa Now you're telling me that it's not authentic, and there is no proof that it is mustahab to recite them. It's been mentioned by some of these brothers. Yes? So why have I been reciting them all my life? I feel let down, some of them have told me, yes? Therefore, the recognition that emerges is, it's a misconception and an idea 
although slightly technical, which involves a little bit of an in-depth analysis related to the Shia heritage and the legacy of the Imams السلام, and the means of identifying what is acceptable or not, but it's at the same time an important area. Why? Because the mission and the movement of the Ahl al-Bayt was very much to stand up against misconceptions, against ideas that emerge in society. I tell you, sometimes we think, why? Why should someone come and shake our aqidah or belief in such a manner? Why don't they stay silent? Do you know who the problem is? The problem is not necessarily with them. That is our belief. The problem is with us, that the ability to respond satisfactorily. Yes, we need to be able to be equipped and have the tools to have dialogue, discussion, debate, intellectual, yes? in order to be able to respond to these objections because that is the school of the Ahl al-Bayt. That is exactly how, for example, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad and al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi would come forward and deal with what? Objections, with ideas thrown at him and others from atheists, from people who follow other religions, from people within the school itself. I tell you how many times you've heard of the debates of the Holy Six Imam with people. Did he say you're not allowed to have this opinion? Or did he have a discussion with them? Did he immediately condemn them? Or did he say let's have dialogue? When somebody comes to him and says, you claim to be the grandson of the Prophet. I will not worship a Lord that I do not see. Show me your God. When you show me your God, I will worship him. Imam said, I will show you. But before I show you, I want you to do one thing for me. He says, what shall I do? He says, go outside and look at the sun for five seconds. The man steps outside, lifts his head, cannot even do it for two seconds. Puts his head down, comes in and says, I cannot do so. He says, why? He says, the rays of the sun are too powerful. Imam responds, if you can't look at that which is created, how can you look at that who is the creator? intellectual dialogue at the time there was a man who used to be what from the christian faith and he had an ability which drew the attention of people what was his ability according to riwayat anything that you hold in your hand and you conceal it from him he can see through your hand and tell you what's inside allah had given him this ability and so he began to shake the aqidah of people People came to Imam al-Sadiq, said, Ya Rasulillah, there is a problem. He said, what? He said, every time we go to him, he tells us what's hidden. People are starting to question, is Islam the religion of Haqq? Because people of other faiths have abilities that we don't have. Imam said, let me speak to him. So he calls him. The man comes to him. Imam says to him, can I ask you a question? He said, yes. He said, how did you reach this state? Tell me. The man said, well, it is because every time in my life, whatever my soul, my nafs tells me to do something, I go against it. I challenge it. I do the opposite. So, in the summer, if I'm wanting to drink cold water, I drink instead hot water. I have practiced extreme self-discipline. Imam said, very well. What is it that I'm holding in my hands now? Imam has something in his hands. This individual looks at him, begins to shake, begins to sweat. Imam says, what's happened? He says, I can see part of paradise, something incredible, something I've never seen before. Imam smiles. He says, yes, I have soil from the grave of my grandfather, Hussein. Imam says to him, what is your soul telling you to do now? He says, my soul is telling me if he has part of paradise with him, then his religion must be the truth, not mine. But my soul is telling me, run away now because he's going to convert you. Gonna really run fast. Imam looks at him and says, what do you normally practice again? The man says, I usually go against my soul. He says, so what are you gonna do now? The man says, very well. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He, he immediately becomes a Muslim. Next morning there's a queue. Wallah, people love these things, don't they? This man can do it. There's a queue outside his house. Sh show me what's inside. Show me what's inside. They come to him. He can't see anymore. He's lost it. He rushes towards Imam Ja'far Sadiq. He says, Ya Rasulillah, yesterday I became a Muslim. Now I can't see anything. My ability to see that which is hidden is gone. 
Imam said, Allah was rewarding you for your self-control in this world. Now that you've become a believer, he will reward you in akhirah. No need for this dunya. The A'imma did not shun away from misconceptions. Yes, the recognition therefore today is any debate out there should take place. Let's have academic discussions. Let's use the member to provide evidence. Let's educate the masses. If someone today comes and asks you, is dua al-iftitah authentic? Or if someone comes and tells you, it's not reliable, it's too negative. It's full of shakwa. It's full of complaining. Yes, they tell you, don't read that dua. Or they come and tell you, dua tawassul. It's not found in our heritage. It's weak. How do you respond? The member is to what? To rise to the occasion, not only to give you and I what we enjoy to hear, but more importantly, what empowers us and purifies our hearts and makes us stronger in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't it? That's why I would like to thoroughly analyze the question of are Shia du'as and ziyaras authentic so that you can tonight walk away from here at least equipped with the ability to answer at the first level these misconceptions by answering the following question number one what is the history of Shia hadith regarding du'as and ziyaras number two which book in particular is very important in this discussion and is it authentic or not Number three, what are the main objections of people who question our du'as and ziyaras? Three objections they have. Number four, how do our ulama respond to these objections? Number five, which marja alive today has gone and looked at Mafatih al-Jinan and has rewritten Mafatih al-Jinan in 860 pages and has called it the Mafatih al-Jadida, the new Mafatih. And number six, why did the Ahl al-Bayt emphasize ziyara so much, especially in relation to ziyara of Sayyid al-Shuhada, Aba Abdullah al-Husayn, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. If you were to ask people here or online today, what book of dua or ziyara do you know? There is a likelihood of one dua book that many people have come to know. And that is Mafatih al-Jinan. Is it it? People will tell you Mafatih al-Jinan is colossal. It's beautiful. It's a collection of the duas and ziyaras that we need without a shadow of a doubt. But the question that I would like to ask you is, is the Shia heritage only based on one great book? Or is it something emphasized by the Ahl al-Bayt during that time? That's very important for us to recognize the history of dua and ziyara collection. When we look at the Sahaba, the companions of the Ahl al-Bayt, we recognize a number of them held books and dedicated time to preserve duas and ziyaras. You say to me, for example, who? A man by the name of Abu Sulaiman, Dawood ibn Kathir al-Raqqi, a companion of the 8th Holy Imam, Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. He had a book which is a compilation of du'as and ziyaras from Ahl al-Bayt. A man by the name of Abil Hassan Ali ibn Mahziyar al-Ahwazi. He had a book by the name of Kitab al-Mazar. And he was a companion of the 8th Imam, the 9th Imam, and the 10th Imam. Unfortunately, these books are lost today. However, later the ulama at the time of the minor occultation, and major occultation, Shaykh al-Mufid, Shaykh al-Saduq, yes, Shaykh al-Tusi and others did phenomenal, colossal work to preserve as much as possible from these books. And they themselves would then author books, compilations of du'as, written hundreds of years ago. You ask me, which three books primarily today are what popular and very well known that have been written for hundreds of years. We need to know the names of these books, isn't it? One of them is called Al-Iqbal by Sayyid Ibn Tawus. And Sayyid Ibn Tawus has authored 1,500 books, one of our great ulama. 60 of these books are on du'as and ziyaras. How many? 60. Now, Sayyid Ibn Tawus died year 664 after Hijrah. You find a, a, a famous book by the name of Misbah Al-Kaf'ami. This misbah is by a great scholar who died in the year 900 after Hijrah. And the third important rich collection of du'as and ziyaras is a book that is often referenced in Mafatih al-Jinan. 
This is Misbahul Mutahajjid by Sheikh al Tusi, Allah Ta'ala Maqama. And of course, Sheikh al Tusi died in the year 1067. The recognition that emerges is what? Is that this, these books were there for hundreds of years. The Shia recited from them. The Shia utilized them. They referred back to them, isn't it? So these du'as and ziyaras that we have today are not only a few years old. They're hundreds of years old, isn't it? From these great scholars. Yet, there is a book of great importance that you and I must know about and you need to get a copy. This book is vital. This book is critical. This book is available in English. It's called Kamilu Ziyarat. Some of you may have heard of Kamilu Ziyarat. If you don't have a copy, download it. It's available online. Kamilu Ziyarat by Sheikh Ibn Qawlawi, a'la Allahu ta'ala maqamah, Ja'far Ibn Qawlawi, is a colossal, absolutely important book, yes, which today is key when it comes to understanding their merits and the excellence of the ziyara of the Ahl al-Bayt, especially of Sayyid al-Shuhada, peace and blessings be upon him. 755 narrations are found in 108 chapters in Kamilul Ziyarat. And throughout the years, what do we find? We find our ulama have paid so much attention to the book Kamilul Ziyarat. Why? Because when you look at the narrations inside Kamilul Ziyarat, you stand in awe to appreciate the status of the Ahl al-Bayt and the merit of the visitation of the shrines of the Ahl al-Bayt and the recitation of the ziyara of these holy individuals. That's why the Ahl al-Bayt were what? Were focused on the ziyara so that we can carry this legacy and the ulama ensured that books like Kamil ziyarat are preserved. And that's why it's translated to English and other languages today, yes? The recognition that emerges is this author of this book, Kamil Ziyarat, what does he say? He says, I wrote this book for the following purpose. In order to get close to Allah, the Holy Prophet, Amir al muminin Sayyida Fatima, and the A'imma alayhum as -salam, and in order to present this beneficial work for the believers. And for hundreds of years, we have been instructed by our scholars to utilize Kamil Ziyarat. Why? Because this great author himself in the intro of the book has said that I have relied upon narrators who are thicker, authentic. So our ulama have come to discuss, is the book Kamil Ziyarat reliable or not? Please bear with me. It might be a slightly dry area, but it's great importance, yes? Kamil Ziyarat is magnificent. It has hundreds of narrations on the merit of the Ziyara of Sayyid al-Shuhada. For example, it tells us that a man who is the grandson of Abu Hamza al-Thumali, Radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi, and a companion of the Holy Sikh Imam, one day wanted to go to Karbala. When he reached Karbala at night, he was what? Afraid that he will be arrested because the visitation of the grave of Sayyid Shuhada was prohibited. When he came close to the grave, he saw an individual who said to him, do not come close now. Now it's dangerous for you. He said, very well. He waited for a while. He came back a bit later, yes? Until he was pushed back time and time again until Fajr time. Finally, at Fajr time, this person said, it's the time for you to visit the grave of Hussein. He looked at this individual and said, who are you? You're the only man here that I can see stopping me from visitation of the grave of my beloved Hussein. Who are you? This particular man looks at him and says, I am one of the angels of Allah that have been placed on this earth to defend the Zawar of Hussein. Yes? In the form of human beings. Angels can come in the form of human beings, isn't it? It's found in the book Kamilu Ziyarat. Yes? And therefore, the question that arises, is the book authentic or not? Here, our ulama have, what, three different opinions. A group of scholars such as Ayatollah al uthman Sayyid Muhammad Sa'id al-Hakim, Hafizahullah, who's alive, one of the maraja in Najaf, says, yes, absolutely authentic, no doubt or issues about it, yes. Some of our other ulama, Sayyid al-Khu'i, Ayatollah al-Uthman, Sayyid al-Khu'i, Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. We have a Sayyid al-Shaheed, Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. And a number of other maraji'ah, they say, well, it is to a certain extent, but when uh, the author of Kamil al-Ziyarat says that all those that I have utilized are reliable, he doesn't mean that all of them connected to the imams. He means the first level 
the first group of narrators that he has taken the du'as and ziyaras from are reliable. Not necessarily what? Not necessarily all those that are connected to the Ahlul Bayt. But that doesn't mean that we neglect this book. At the first level, these narrators are reliable. Then we have a group of our ulama who have said, no, even that, there is a question mark that some say, for example, I told my Sayyidi Sistani, Hafidullah, he says we cannot deduce that all of them are reliable because at least 60 of them have been shown to be weak, the narrators that are found in the book Kamil Ziyarat. However, we should treat it with respect and understand that many of these narrations are very useful. Many of these narrations can be acted upon, as we will discuss very shortly. Yes? Now, the question is, some people come forward and say, very well, you have talked about the past, now let's look at what we have at the moment. We have these hadiths that we cannot accept. They give three reasons why these du'as and ziyaras cannot be recited. What are they? I am here to discuss academic. I am not interested for emotional bashing. I am not interested in character assassination. Yes, We are here to discuss what they have said and a response to what they have said. Number one, they have said, this is da'if. And a hadith in hadith studies that is da'if cannot be, what, utilized. Sometimes it is a lone narration, khabar ahad, only narrated by one individual. And so ulama usually, some of them, they what, they put aside any narration that is only narrated by one individual. Or if it is weak, based on the narrators not being reliable. Number one. Number two, they say not only this, some of these ziyaras and du'as, they have sentences which are problematic. Something which can't, we can't explain. For example, the ziyara known as ziyara to Jami' al-Kabira. It is narrated from the holy 10th Imam, Imam Ali al-Hadi, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. They come forward and they say this particular ziyara says ilaykum, that the creation all return back to you. They say this clearly contradicts the Quran because Allah says in Surah Ghashiyah verse number 25 Inna iyabahum, they return back to me. So they say look it's clear that this ziyara can't have been from the imams because they claim that it contradicts the Quran. Yes. And the third accusation or objection that they have about our hadith related to du'as and ziyara is the following. They say some of them are hurtful to other Muslims. They are not necessarily respecting some of the people that the other Muslims honor. And therefore, in order not to create disunity, we should not be reciting some ziyaras. And here they quote, for example, ziyarat Ashura. How have the ulama responded to this? First of all, the group of ulama, our raja, have categorically come forward in defense of ziyara literature and the du'as of the Ahl al-Bayt. Number one, as a general principle, let me quote to you some of our maraji' what have they said in this particular regard. Ayatullah al-Khu'i, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, was asked, what is your opinion about du'a al-Faraj? He, resp he responded and says, yu'ta bi al fadl yu'ta thawab al fadl that you should recite it with the intention that you will be blessed and you will inshallah be rewarded yes in other words encouragement recite it ayatullah sistani hafizahullah was asked regarding mafatih al-jinan they say mafatih al-jinan should we recite the duas from it or not listen to the response of his eminence these duas he says are narrated narrated from a'immatul ma'sumin فَلَا بَأْسَ بِقِرَاءَتِهَا وَقَارِئُهَا مَأْجُورٌ وَمُثَابٌ إِن شَاءَ اللَّهِ There is no problem with reciting the du'as in, in Mafatih al-Jinan and those who recite the du'as will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A third group of ulama was asked about du'a al-Nudba. Sayyid Muhammad Sa'id al-Hakim. 
a marja, yes, today in Iraq. He was asked, what is your opinion about dua and nudba? This is his response. Sanaduhu laysa sahihan bil ma'na al-mustalah. He says, when I look at dua and nudba, it is not necessarily authentic as far as his chain of narrations is concerned. However, he says, illa annahu mashhurun bayna qudama al-ashab. Please understand this. This is the first key thing. He says, this dua, as well as many others, is popular and has been recited by our ulama for hundreds of years. It is established. And just because today we cannot prove its authenticity in as far as chain of narration is concerned, it doesn't mean we dismiss it. Yes? Then he says, That will give me, he says, and everyone, satisfaction that it is reliable. It's been narrated and recited for many different people. Yes? And therefore, he goes on to say, another reason why we respect it, as an example of a dua that should be recited, is, The content of dua is brilliant. And this is one of the proofs of the fact that this dua is good and should be recited. Someone says, these are the statements of maraja. How do you respond to those three points that the people have presented? Please understand the next few minutes, yes? Focus with me so that you can be equipped. There is no who wants to be a millionaire game when it comes to these things. What does that mean? Someone looking at me think, what is he talking about? When you and I are asked outside by our children at schools, university, you can't say 50-50 Mkola Maulana. Let's be what equipped with ilm, yes? You can call Maulana, no problem. Number one, you might not get a Maulana very quickly, or they may not respond to your email as sufficiently as you want to. And number two, let's be ourselves advancing the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. Let us be ourselves the defenders of the school of Ali Muhammad. Let us be knowledgeable. Yes, not necessarily able to know all the teachings. Not necessarily that the ulama necessarily know all the teachings. But you and I can strive. Yes? Now, how do we respond, respond to these three points? The response is the following. Yes. In hadith literature, normally, we look at the hadith and analyze the chain of narrations. And we assess, is it Hassan, is it Mutawatir, is it Va'if? Yes, these terms that are given, no doubt. You're right in that. But where are you mistaken? You're mistaken in the recognition that just because a dua or a ziyara is weak, it doesn't mean it must not be recited and it's not mustahab to recite it. This deduction is not established. This conclusion is not agreed upon. This idea is not something that we subscribe to. Let me repeat. If we have a dua or a ziyara that is da'if, this doesn't mean this dua or ziyara must be placed on the side and not recited. You say to me, hold on, why? Because it's not necessarily strong in its chain of narrations. Isn't that the only criteria today? It is not the only criteria. That is where, unfortunately, we mustn't panic when we hear someone online placing these doubts in our minds. All of a sudden start to scream foul or start to panic, run up and down all my life. Take a chill pill. Sit back and relax and ask the ulama. Yes, we have 1,400 years of heritage. They can't be dismissed by one and two online. When you come to this, what is the response of our ulama? What is the response? They say the following, yes? They say there are principles in Islamic jurisprudence. Usul. These principles are applied on certain aspects when it comes to hadith. Yes? What are these principles? Understand this principle and you'll be able to understand how is it applied when it comes to du'as and ziyaras. This principle is called قَاعِدَةُ التَّسَامُحْ فِي أَدِلَّةِ sunan. The principle of permissibility, yes, when it comes to looking at the evidence. What is the, per the principle of permissibility mean? I know it's slightly technical, 
This is a Hawzawi discussion, but I want to raise you to the level to understand the level that we need to engage in debate. Yes? What does this mean? This qa'ida, this principle, what does it refer to? Epistemically, when it comes to this particular principle, it's derived from intellect, it's derived from consensus of our ulama, and from hadith. What does it say? It says, when it comes to non-obligatory acts of worship, we do not necessarily need stringent of application of rules associated with hadith. Because it's non-obligatory acts of worship. And when it comes to this, our ulama have said, this is the opinion of our scholars, they have come forward and said, this qa'idat al-tasamuh fi adillat sunan means that I can overlook the fact that these narrations are weak because I am seeking the satisfaction of Allah, number one. And number two, the content of these narrations are profound. They are indicative of the excellence of whom? Of Ali Muhammad. They match the status and therefore they will be beneficial for the upliftment of people. May Allah bless the soul of Allama Taba Tabai. He had a, a friend by the name of Professor Henry Coburn. Professor Henry Coburn was somebody who used to have debates with Allama, yes, from France. One day Allama wrote to him, he said, I, as a Muslim, we have du'as, we speak to God, the Almighty. We have our own supplications. What is it that you have as Christians? How do you speak to God, you as a Christian? Professor Henry Coburn re responds, and the response is still available, you can see it. He says, I, as a Christian, have my own way of speaking to God. That way is by reading Sahifatu Sajjadiya of Zain al Abidin. The recognition that emerges is perhaps today some of us have missed the excellence of these du'as, the mesmerizing words of these supplications. But non-believers are what are utilizing them. They're benefiting from them. A friend of mine many years ago from Cambridge University, he is from the Faculty of Engineering. He told me personally, it's not something I saw or looked up in Sheikh Google, rest assured, yes? He says to me, every month we have a journal of engineering from Cambridge University. He says, the editor of the journal is a non-Muslim. He says, every month he makes an effort in the editorial as much as possible to quote something from Nahjul Balagha. Yeah. The recognition therefore is, if the treasure is out there and we do not recognize the treasure, this doesn't take away from the fact that it's a treasure. It is our mistake. It is our fault, isn't it? Therefore, the ulama say this principle is applied. What do we mean? It means that when I come to such hadiths based on a number of factors. Number one, the content is rich. Number two, I am not required to be stringent on matters such as dua. Because dua has so many dimensions. It has historical dimension, theological dimension, spiritual dimension. All these dimensions are present in dua. I do not necessarily need to because of the benefits. But number three, it's been narrated and passed on from one generation to another by our ulama, yes? And this is satisfactory. Now, we have a number of maraji' who said this principle, we take it. And based on this principle, yes, we accept that these narrations are reliable and acceptable and our du'as and ziyaras are mustahab to recite. Who are these maraji'? Ayatullah al-Gulbaygani, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. Before him, Shaykh al-Ansari, rahmatullahi alayhi. Al-Shaheed al-Awwal, the first martyr, rahmatullahi alayhi. Today, Ayatullah al-Uzma, Sayyid Sadiq al-Ruhani, hafidahullah. Today, Ayatullah al-Uzma, Sayyid Sadiq al-Shirazi, hafidahullah. These scholars and more say that this principle is sufficient for me. This principle, we apply it. We apply it to any dua, any ziyara that is weak in narration and gives us satisfaction that we get reward from Allah for reciting it. You ask me, where is the proof from hadith for this principle? I tell you, it's a beautiful narration from the sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Oh. 
The principle is based on this hadith. Please understand this hadith. Imam Ali Salam says that man balagahu shay'un min al-thawab fa'amilah. Today someone tells you if you do something you will get thawab. And the person telling you is reliable. A marja, a scholar, an alim tells you if you recite these two rak'ah salah you'll get thawab. And you do it based on the fact that someone told you is reliable or at least there is benefit in it. You will get the reward for this. Even if the messenger had not said this. What is Imam Sadiq saying? Saying that if it's non-obligatory acts of worship, if you come with the intention that you want to worship Allah, you want to get close to Allah, you want to develop an affinity relationship with Allah and His chosen servants, the Ahl al-Bayt, and based on this you do a deed, you'll get the reward for that deed. Even though there may not be a basis for that deed from the hadith of the Ahl al-Bayt. Now, they will respond and say, oh, hold on, there are maraja today who don't accept this principle. Qa'idatu tasamuh this principle of permissibility when it comes to evidence, there are some scholars who say we don't accept it. Amongst those who do not necessarily accept it as a principle is Ayatollah al-Uthman Sayyidi Sistani Hafizahullah. Yes? And Sayyid al-Khu'i, Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. And a number of other maraji' they come and say, no, that is not sufficient for us. The question is, how do they view the dua and the ziyara literature? How do they view it? This is their response. They say, if there is a dua or a ziyara which is weak in narration, it should be recited with the intention of what is known as Raja'ul Matlubiya, in the hope that it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has indeed passed on through the prophets and the Imams. In that hope, and you will get the thawab for it. Therefore, they are the defenders of these duas and these ziyaras. They say, recite it. Yes, recite it in that hope. Why? Because the content can transform your life. Because it will invariably make you in a better state. I tell you, when we read Dua'i Arafah, when we read Dua'i Kumail, when we read these supplications, what does it do to you and I? Especially when we understand what is it that we're saying. Especially when we live the words of Ali Muhammad. It has truly a potential to change lives. Isn't it? Similarly, these du'as are there for a purpose. These ziyaras are there for a purpose. Please understand. They're there to enhance aqidah. Yes, you look at Sahifa Sajjadiya. You look at other supplications. Many of these were uttered by the fourth holy imam based on misconceptions that existed. Anthropomorphism, for example. Yes, shirk and others. They strengthen beliefs such as wilaya of Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam The love of Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam They are beneficial. They are useful. They get us closer to Allah, closer to the Ahl al-Bayt. Someone asks, what about the second point? What do you mean second point? They say, very, very well, you are saying that many of the maraji' say we should recite them because we have hope that it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the prophets and that raja, we, we recite it with that raja, yes? But some content is problematic, they say. In Ziyarat al-Jami' al-Kabira, it says that you all return back to us. Whereas the Quran says in Surah Al-Ghashiyah 25, you all return back to Allah. This is contradictory. How do we respond? First of all, every single one of these has an answer. And the answer can be found and easily dismissed. What is the answer to this? As an example, yes? When we come to this system, it works through means. It works through ways, yes? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Allahu yatawaffal anfus hina mawtiha. It's Allah who takes the souls at the time of death. He also says, Qul yatawaffakum malakul maut. It is the angel of death who takes your soul. Which one is it? Tell me, which one? Allah says in one ayah, I take the soul. In another, he says the angel of death takes the soul. Which one? Is this a contradiction? No. Allah is saying, I ultimately take the soul but through the angel of death, because I have given him the power to take the soul of human beings. It's a means, a sbab. When the Ahl al-Bayt say, you return back to us, that means we are your representatives. We will be answerable to Allah regarding every ummah that we lead. 
يوم ندعو كل أناس بإمامهم القرآن says every group of people and nation will be called upon by their leader simple someone says دعاء الافتتاح is negative اللهم إنا نشكو إليك فقد نبينا yes. وقلة عددنا وشدة الفتن بنا what is this negativity how do we respond every single one of these has a response I tell you you say dua iftitah is negative have you read the Quran because in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya Prophet Ya'qub says innama ashku bathi wa hammi ila Allah I am complaining to Allah my sadness my situation how many times did the Prophet speak to Allah and say our situation is terrible massana wa ahlana dhur wa anta arhamur rahimin when the Imam is speaking, wanting you and I to supplicate, it's a means of desperation, humiliation. It's a means for you and I to say, Ya Allah, we have nothing. It's all from you. Help us. This is the spirit of dua. What's wrong with it? What is wrong with expressing sentiments of desperation before Allah? I tell you, Allah, one of the most important qualities for a believer to get their dua answered is desperation. How many times we recite, Amma yujibul muftarra idha da'a. What is muftar? Desperate. Allah wants us to be desperate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to supplicate to him wholeheartedly, yes. And therefore this accusation is also something that we can easily dismiss. The third is this. They say, what about ziyaras that hurt the feelings of other people? You should not recite these ziyaras. Therefore, pick and choose. Some of them recite only the beginning, cut out the end. Because you have to care about whom? You have to care about people who are around you, and so on and so forth. First of all, the Ahl al-Bayt know better than you and I. In the idea when the Ahl al-Bayt have presented this literature for us, yes? In the recognition that, yes, you might say to me, we don't know for 100% sure. But the fact that it survived all this time, it's divine intervention, number one. Number two, do we not believe in wilaya and bara'a? What is la ilaha illallah except wilaya and bara'a? La ilaha is bara'a, dissociation from anything that way it associates itself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Illallah is wilaya. Yes? In the recognition that these duas and these supplications serve a very important purpose. They are not there simply for us to recite and think that what? And think that all of a sudden everything is what? Is having to be considered about others. Yes, our maraja tell us without a shadow of a doubt. That in certain instances, naming certain people, sending direct la'na upon certain individuals publicly, these are direct guidelines of our maraja. But our maraja and our ulama and our esteemed scholars know exactly what is beneficial for you and I, what is beneficial for the spiritual growth, theological growth, the strengthening of our communities, understanding what's right and wrong. And that is why they present this literature. That is why they come to us and say, for example, when it comes to du'as and ziyaras, like ziyarat Ashura, it should be recited completely. Not somehow, you know, reduced in the fear that others may interpret this or that. Yes? That is why one of the maraji' today who has looked at this is Ayatollah al-Uzma, Sheikh Nasir Makaram al-Shirazi, Hafizahullah. Sheikh Nasir Makaram has looked at Mafatih al-Jinan and said, you know what? I want to present a version of Mafatih al-Jinan that I believe is acceptable. How many pages? 831 pages in this book. What does he include in it? Dua al-Tawassul, Hadith al-Kisa, yes? Ziyarat Ashura, Ziyarat Warith. Many of these duas that we have based on his research as a marja' on reliability, on acceptability, yes? Incidentally, Hadith al-Kisa that we recite is not found in Mafatih al-Jinan. But Ayatollah Nasir Makarim placed it in his book. Lest some people say, oh, it's not acceptable, the weak narration. No, 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 no. No, the content matches the riwayat. And it is what? It is of the utmost importance. That's why the ulama come to us and say, those questioning dua e tawassul, those questioning ziyarat ashura, ziyarat warith, have missed a major point 
with regards to understanding the ethos behind the existence of these ziyarat. I tell you, when you look at Kamil ziyarat, when you reflect upon the narrations emphasizing the powerful impact and the merits of the ziyarah of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam and the Ahl al-Bayt, you stand in admiration. Thursday nights, day of Eid, nights of Qadr, many, 50 Sha'ban, first Sha'ban, 50th Rajab, Ziyarat al Hussein, Ziyarat al Hussein, Ziyarat al Hussein. Yes. Similarly, when we go, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you all of those who perform the Ziyarat of the shrine of Aba Abdullah. I tell you, I came to calculate the benefits of the Ziyarat of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam recited, as well as that which includes the visitation. I found more than 134 benefits in this world and akhirah. Found in narration after narration. And sometimes we underestimate the beauty of the siyara. I just tell you one point, yes? That this great scholar of ours, one of our great maraja, who's written a book, Al-Urwatul Wuthqa, as Sayyid Kazim al-Yazdi. Today our maraja write commentaries of this book. This great scholar who's buried in proximity to Amir al-Mu'mineen, says that I made an intention that I want to have a special kafan, a shroud for myself. And this shroud, I wanted Ziyarat Ashura to be written on it, but before that, the entire Quran. So the entire Quran was written on it when somebody was sitting next to the shrine of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says, later I took it and I sat next to the shrine of Sayyid al-Shuhada, next to the Dharih, and wrote Ziyarat Ashura on this kafan. I said, this kafan is for me, please. I took it everywhere I went. When I went back to my city as a marja in Yazd in Iran, he said, the first night I arrived, when I went to sleep, I saw a dream repeatedly. When a marja says, I saw a dream, it's not like you and I seeing a dream, yes? Some people say, oh, immediately he's mentioned dream from the member, I'm switching off. No, sometimes when a marja say, these are God-fearing people, yes? When this marja said, I saw a dream, then I woke up. Then I saw it again, then I woke up. Same time, what was the dream? He said, I saw Sayyid al-Shuhada tell me that kafan, take it towards a man by the name of Bilal, and you must give it to him. That kafan is for him. I woke up again. Same, same. Early hours of the morning, four o'clock in the morning, I woke up finally and said, I have to find this Bilal. So I made some calls. I went, please find me. Who is this Bilal in Yazd? They said, Molana, there are so many of these people. We don't know. I said, find me. I have to find him. I have to give him this kafan. So all of a sudden, he thought with himself, who needs a kafan? Must be someone who's passed away. Therefore, they went to the Ghusl Khana. In the early hours of the morning, they asked, do you have someone who needs to be washed? They said, yes. What's his name? Bilal. Alhamdulillah. We found him. He enters. The marja enters. They all look at him. They say, Mulana, you have entered. What is it that we can do? It's a, such an honor you visit. He said, no. I'm just here to give you this kafan. Please shroud this man with this kafan. They said, is this a special kafan? He said, don't worry. Just do it. He leaves. He goes to the house of this marhum. Knocks on the door. They are surprised. They say, well, please welcome. You are the marja. You are the great scholar. They welcome him. He sits there. He says, I have one question to ask you. This marhum of yours that passed away, what was so special about him? What did he do? They said, Maulana, he did nothing extra special. He just worked. He prayed. He did everything. He said, please tell me, did he have a habit? He said, the only thing that he would never ever miss in his life, something he did every single day after each salah, he had never ever been in his life to Karbala. But after each salah, he would pray upstairs on the roof, turn towards Karbala from Yazd in his city and say, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Every single salah, he never missed it. The marja said, that's it. That's it. Do not underestimate the power of the ziyara. What can this ziyara do in our lives? Those who are questioning dua tawassul and ziyarat warith and ziyarat ashura unfortunately are mistaken. Because these ziyaras, yes, these ziyaras have been close to our hearts all our lives. And no YouTube clip is going to make us leave this ziyara. Because heads have been chopped and the ziyara continues. Thousands have given their lives for the ziyarah of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. But the ziyarah continues. The recitation continues. This Muharram 
Each and every one of us, if you have a question about the ziyara, ask. But ultimately, we must become the ambassadors and the defenders of the heritage of Ali Muhammad. Of this ziyara literature is our responsibility. In which way? We must recite it and understand it and teach it to our children in the language that they understand it. Sometimes we recite it just so that we get the tick. But more importantly, connect with these holy individuals. Appreciate the value of what is it that you are reciting, isn't it? That is why amongst the Ahl al-Bayt whom we recite a ziyara for, but we are often rushed because we are not allowed to stand to honor his demolished grave, is Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba. In Jannatul Baqiyah, there are no mourners tonight. In Jannatul Baqiyah, there are no majalis tonight. In Jannatul Baqiyah, there are no ma'atam or shrines tonight. And the four Imams are alone in the darkness of the night. <laughs> Imam al Hassan would be somebody who would understand what it means to remember Aba Abdullah. Narrations tell us that Imam al Hassan, peace be upon him, would be in a state of what? Honoring Aba Abdullah. Relationship between them was so special. A loving brotherly relationship. That is why it was so painful in the final days of the life of the Imam when the poison had spread around his body. The narrations tell us that Imam al Hussein was always next to Imam al Hassan. And Imam al Hassan, because of the ferocious nature of the poison, he used to what? He used to spit out part of his liver. He used to sometimes vomit part of his blood. And they had a bowl. And Imam al Hussein would have his bowl next to him in order to be able to help Imam al Hassan. One moment, in one instance, Imam al Hussein was next to whom? Next to Imam al Hassan nursing him. And who enters the room? Sayyida Zainab. When Sayyida Zainab enters the room, the narrations tell us Imam al Hassan looked at Imam al Hussein. He said, I ask you, cover this bowl. Why? I don't want to see my, do my sister Zainab to see the bowl and the blood. Allahu Akbar. Imam al Hassan was thinking about Zainab. Imam al Hussein was thinking about Zainab. Before them, Amir al Mu'mineen was thinking about Zainab. I say to her, Sayyida Zainab, they would not want you to see that bowl. What bowl did you see in Sham and what head did it contain? Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, final moments, he looks at Aba Abdullah, he begins to cry. Imam al Hussein said, Is it the pain of the poison? He said, No. He said, Why, oh my dear brother, why is it that you're crying? He said, La yawm ka yawmuka ya Aba Abdullah. There is no day like you, O oh Hussein. I could just see, I could just see the skies weeping for you, the rocks weeping for you, the animals crying for you. Yes, sir. Oh Hussein, there is no day like yours. That is why on the 10th of Muharram, Aba Abdullah kept Imam al Hassan in his mind, isn't it? Kept Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, his remembrance. He missed his brother on the 10th of Muharram. But the eve of Ashura is when he recognized there is a musiba. Yes. He talked to his sahaba, he talked to his companions. He said, Tomorrow is the day of Shahada. There was a young man who stood up. He looked at his uncle. He said, Uncle, how will we attain to martyrdom tomorrow? Aba Abdullah looks at Qasim. He looks at his nephew. He says to him, My dear nephew, what is death to you? Qasim says, says, my uncle, wallah, death is sweeter than honey. He said, yes, you will be amongst the martyrs, inshallah. Qasim now is anticipating shahada. Qasim, according to narrations, was either 12 or 13. He was preparing himself on the day of Ashura. He came walking to Aba Abdullah. He became with a request. He looked at his uncle. He said, Amma, Aba Abdullah, grant me permission to fight. 
right. Allow me to go to the battlefield. Imam al Hussein looks at him. He says, Waladi Qasim, Anta Wadi'atu Akhi al Hassan. You are what remains from my son Hassan. I do not wish to see you go to the battlefield. Here I saw a narration. Wallah, it breaks the heart. The narration says that Qasim fell on the feet of Imam al Hussein and began to kiss the feet of Abba Abdullah. Then he kissed the hand of Hussein. Uncle, I beg you, let me fight. Please let me fight. What about your mother? What about your family? No, they have sent me. Aba Abdullah tears up. The tears come down from his cheeks, yes? He looks at this young man, fully prepared, fully determined, with full of valor and courage. When he gives him permission, he asks him to do one thing. He says, I ask you to go to your tent and bid farewell to your mother. Bid farewell to the ladies of Ahl al-Bayt. Qasim goes back. Yes, Qasim enters the tent. Narayshis tell us that he was wearing the Aba of Imam al-Hassan. He was wearing the, uh, what? He was wearing the turban of Imam al-Hassan. He was holding the sword of Imam al-Hassan. Those around him, his mother, the Ahl al-Bayt, Sayyidah Zainab, that moment when they looked at him, they cried out, Wa Hassana, Wa Akhar. That moment reminded them of Imam al-Hassan al-Mujtabaha. It was one of the most difficult moments for the Ahl al-Bayt to bid farewell for this young man. They began to hold him. They began to embrace him. They began to bid farewell to him. It was the time for Wida. It was the time to bid farewell. Yes. No mother wants to bid farewell to any of her family members, especially for her children. The narrations tell us that Qasim made his way towards the battlefield. When he made his way towards the battlefield, he was like a shining moon. The narrations tell us that he fought so courageously that the enemies were surprised. A young man who fights with such courage, with such shuja and valor. One of the narrators, Humayd ibn Muslim, says, I saw a young man emerge. His face was like a bright moon. His face was illuminating. Yes. And he fought with such determination but I still remember he says, he was wearing sandals and on his left sandals the strips were undone. Slightly it became undone. But this man was a man of principles. This young man did not wish to fight with his strips of his sandals undone. He said that moment I saw him bow down in order to repair the strip of his sandals ah jarakum allah ya sahib al asr wa al zaman he says i'm a man i saw him coming close to him i looked at this man i said what is it that you wish to do he said i will make his uncle mourn for him he said what are you going to do he lifted the sword he struck the sword on the head of this young man qasim the sword split the head of qasim Qasim fell on the ground. Alayka minni salam, Ammah ya Hussein. My uncle Hussein, peace be upon you. Aba Abdullah marches like a lion who's angry towards the battlefield. He finds the enemy, the person who has struck Qasim. He immediately kills him and sits next to his nephew with the tears flowing. He looks at his nephew and cries, O oh Qasim, O oh Qasim, how can you call your uncle and I am not able to help you and now I am next to you. I can't save you. That moment the narrations tell us that Imam al Hussein was seen placing his chest on the chest of Qasim ووضع صدره على صدر قاسم الله أكبر why did Aba Abdullah place his chest on the chest of Qasim it's like saying oh Qasim you have left this world but I am next to you 
Your chest is on my chest. Ya Hussein, you placed your chest on the chest of Qasim. But what did they place on your chest? Ya Aba Abdullah. He carried the body of Qasim. He entered the tent where there was the body of Bani Hashim. The body is there. He placed the body of Qasim next to Akbar. He looked at Akbar. Then he looked at Qasim. Then he looked at the other martyrs from Bani Hashim. And he began to cry. Sayyidah Zainab entered. She says, Akhi Aba Abdullah, the mother of Qasim wants to come and warn. He says to her, let her mourn. Let her come. She comes. She enters. She looks at that sight of her son Qasim. Him. I tell you, there is one thing seeing your son what die, and another seeing his head split. She looks at the head split of Qasim. She sits next to the body. She begins to cry. The poet says, she says, Qasim, Qasim, my beloved Qasim, did they quench your thirst on the battlefield? You were thirsty before you went. I wish I had some water to quench your thirst, my Qasim, my Qasim my Qasim why would they do this to your head she weeps and cries but I tell you this great lady did she lose only Qasim or someone else I leave you with this musibah yes when Aba Abdullah al Hussein was on the plains of Karbala all by himself in his final moments there was the brother of Qasim by the name of Abdullah ibn al Hassan 11 years of age he rushes out from the tent he comes to Imam Al Hussein. He sees Imam Al Hussein in that state. He hugs Aba Abdullah on his chest. He begins to cry. He says, Uncle Hussein, who is it that stabbed you on your face? Who is it that's got an arrow on your heart? Who is it that severed your hands? He hugs Aba Abdullah. Imam Al Hussein hugs him. This is his nephew. This is the son of Imam Al Hassan Al Mujtaba. At that moment, Harmala said, I took a three pronged arrow. I look at that child. He was on the chest of Hussein. فَذَبَحْتَهُ مِنَ الْوَرِيدِ إِلَى الْوَرِيدِ I slaughtered him. I struck the arrow. The arrow struck his body. In his final moments he cried, Oh Hussein uncle, look what they've done to me. أَلَا لَعَنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الظَّانِمِ سيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلب ينقلبون